Hey Booktube, welcome back to the History Shelf. I am your host Peg. Um, hope you, everyone's been uh, doing well. Um, <clears throat> coming to you the day before the longest day of the year. Um, it's been staying bright here in Denver, Colorado and the environs uh, well past 8.30 at night. Um, so the sun is just shining all the time. And uh, yeah, I guess tomorrow will be the summer solstice, or is it the 21st? I forget. But anyway, <clears throat> um, I meant to make a video way sooner than this. Um, I think I've been taking a little bit of a, uh, a break as far as just trying not to put too much pressure on myself to constantly, you know, churn out um, book reviews and writing and work and videos and all that good stuff. But I really miss making videos. Um, so I am going to try to, to get at least two out per week, maybe more. Uh, especially when I have a <clears throat> nice week-long vacation coming next week, which I really need. And uh, I figured for my birthday, which is next Monday, I could definitely just take some time off. So just to, you know, relax and I'll probably make some more videos. But I've got a lot of books to share with you today, you guys. Um, you know I do a lot of shopping at Hamilton Book, which is a bargain, bargain book outlet online. And a lot of you are familiar with it and have bought books from Hamilton Book. Um, I usually will browse, put things away in a cart, and maybe like two or three times a year I do a big old purchase from them. So my last major purchase from them, well this is my second, this is my penultimate uh, book haul. Um, so I'm just getting around to it now. But I wanted to share with you some history, nonfiction, uh, current issues, theology, Christian history. I've got I got a smattering of everything and then one one work of fiction. <clears throat> well, let's start with the history, shall we? So I picked up Elizabeth, um, The Forgotten Years by John Guy or Guy. I'm not sure if he's French, but uh, I'm going to say Guy. John Guy, he's the author of Queen of Scots, which I picked up in paperback from Book Outlet, I think, <clears throat> in one of my previous book hauls from Book Outlet. Uh, Look at this a pristine condition. I mean, these are new books at Hamilton Book. You know, I know Book Depository went away and everyone was weeping and moaning about it, but you know, frankly, I think Hamilton Book is way better and they give you bargain prices um, for books that are new, not used. So, just thought I'd mention check out Hamilton Book. Elizabeth. The Forgotten Years, which is just that. It's about her forgotten years. I, I, I can't read every book jacket. I don't think you want me to. Um, but, uh, yeah. I've got a, several books on Elizabeth, and I was curious to kind of read his work on Elizabeth, as well as, you know, maybe start off with the uh, Queen, Queen of Scots, and then move into Elizabeth, The Forgotten Years, but I picked this one up. A uh, slim little volume I found on Hamilton. It's a part of a series called Witness to History. This is Prelude to Revolution, the Salem Gunpowder Raid of 1775 by Peter Charles Hoffer. This was put out by Johns Hopkins Press. As you can see, it's a very slim little volume. Um, it says here, before colonial Americans could declare independence, <clears throat> they had to undergo a change of heart beyond a desire to rebel against British mercantile and mercantile and fiscal policies, they had to believe that they could stand up to the fully armed British soldier. Prelude to Revolution uncovers one story of how the Americans found that confidence. Um, and this would be pertaining to the Salem gunpowder raid. So, nice little slim volume in their Witness to History series. I, I don't think I have any of the other ones that are in this series, so it's my, my first time being introduced to it. Um, oh, some of the other titles look really good, like King Philip's War, Colonial Expansion, Native Resistance, and the End of Indian Sovereignty by Daniel R. Mendel. Uh, Tim Lehman's Bloodshed at Little Bighorn, Sitting Bull Custer and the Destinies of Nations. Ooh, and then this one looks really good. The Caning of Charles Sumner, Honor, Idealism, and the Origins of Civil War, of the Civil War, by William James Hull Hoffer. Ow! wonder if he's related to uh, this Hoffer right here. Okay, next book I picked up is from Regnery. 
and this is called The Last Imperialist, Sir Alan Burns' Epic Defense of the British Empire, by Bruce Gilley. Not too, uh, too huge of a read, but uh, I was intrigued by it. Um, I had never really heard of Alan Burns, but let's see here. I'll try to read you a little bit here. In this provocative book, I'm sure it will be, Bruce Gilley recovers the sober and s sympathetic assessments of the British Empire <clears throat> of one of its ablest and most experienced administrators. History's largest empire, now almost universally reviled, spread parliamentary government, the rule of law, and free markets around the globe, while its precipitous demise brought chaos, corruption, and want. In the empire's twilight years, many conservatives doubted Britain could afford its imperial burdens, while socialists saw them as an unwarranted distraction from building a domestic welfare state. Communists hypo hypocritically condemned imperialism. S Whoa, sorry, the way that word was broken up, I'm so <laughs> hypocritically. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a bit tired. And I, I get interrupted in my sleep last night a few times, so. Uh, communists hypocritically condemned imperialism outright. But Sir Alan Burns, whose responsibilities had ranged from British Honduras to Nigeria and from the Bahamas to Fiji, was among the few brave uh, voices protesting the retreat from empire. He upheld the benefits of imperialism to the colonized and warned, with dreadful accuracy, that benign British rule might be replaced by native despotism, made all the more dangerous by Ill illiberal socialist doctrines. Oh, this is going to be juicy. Um, the Last Imperialist is a courageous work of history, refuting pernicious myths and distortions, and rebutting the British Empire's dogmatic critics. Okay. This is history writing at its bravest. So, I'm intrigued. I like to read these things and make up my own mind. I wish more people would be would be in that vein of thought that they're not uh, just you know, read things that upset you, read things that you agree with and disagree with. And you know, and just kind of formulate your own <clears throat> your own uh, your view on things, you know? All about learning. So The Last Imperialist. And I was really excited to see this book arrive on HamiltonBook.com because I was waiting for it, but I didn't, I couldn't afford the full price or it just wouldn't have been good with my budget. So I waited until it was marked down to like $7.95. Yay! And it's ready and it's a Civil War history book. And this is called A Thousand May Fall. Life, Death, and Survival in the Union Army by Brian Matthew Jordan. It's put up by uh, Live Right Books. You know me, I'm a Civil War buff through and through. I, I, can't, I can't read enough. And in fact, I'm reading a book right now that I'll be reviewing in a written review. Um, it's put up by Potomac Books, uh, University of Nebraska Press. It's called 12 Days. And it's, it's a history, and I've read almost, I've read tons of Civil War history books, right? But this is the first one that really tackles the uh, the 12 days between um, is it Lincoln's call for, um, well, after the firing on Fort Sumter, and then they left Fort Sumter, it covers those 12 days where Washington, D.C. was really uh, surrounded, you know, they, they were trying to get some Union troops in there to help defend the city, and people were calling for the, the, the Confederates to march on Washington, so and he's writing it in detail, like from day to day, almost like in present tense, like you are there. It's fantastic. Anyway, there's always something new to discover with Civil War historiography, and people are always trying to write new new things on smaller events that it maybe have been under under looked at or underestimated as far as their importance. So, yeah, I love it. So, anyway, let's get back to this one. A Thousand May Fall. So this one kind of looks at one, uh, one regiment. I think it's a regiment um, over time. It says here, um, at the heart of Jordan's vital account is the 107th Ohio Volunteer Infantry, which was at once representative and exceptional. 
Its ranks weathered the human ordeal of war in painstakingly routine ways, fighting in two defining battles, um, Chancellorsville and Gettysburg, each time in the thick of the killing. But the men of the 107th were not lauded as heroes for their bravery and their suffering. Most of them were ethnic Germans, set apart by language and identity, and their loyalties were regularly questioned by a nativist northern press. We so often assume that the Civil War was a uniquely American conflict, yet Jordan emphasizes the forgotten contributions made by immigrants to the Union cause. An incredible one quarter of the Union army was foreign born, he shows, with 200,000 native Germans alone fighting to save their adopted homeland and prove their patriotism. Uh, okay, so it kind of follows this regiment. And how, um, yeah, it looks interesting. It's just how the men kind of dealt with battle and their, their role in it and, and uh, you know, the deeper meanings, and personal questions about citizenship and, and slavery and, and emancipation. <clears throat> uh, so, a thousand may fall. Where are we at? 11 minutes. I'm sorry my voice is so cracky and scratchy. We've had um, air quality alerts here in uh, the metro Denver area. Uh, for a day and a half and I noticed like two days ago <clears throat> I've got gunk I'm coughing up in my throat and yeah so I don't know what's going on uh, we're not we don't have any forest fires nearby that would cause that it's just like an ozone warning but there's something in the air and we're on an air quality alert until like 6 p.m. tonight which is about now so who knows? Um, let's move on. Okay. Oh, I've got two fictions, not one. I should have corrected myself. Uh, this looked interesting. I'm not sure this this has been fully vetted, but um, I've been collecting a few books on the uh, the outbreak of COVID in Wuhan and. Um, this one was on the site and looked interesting, so I picked up Wuhan Diary, Dispatches from a Quarantine City by Fang Fang. Now, I think, translated by Michael Berry, but I think Fang Fang is her, uh, her pseudonym. Um, I think so. May not be. <laughs> um, well, no, I guess that is her name. She's an acclaimed Chinese writer. Uh, and she started doing an online diary at, at the beginning of 2020. Um, and then, so, I think this, this is called from her online, her online diary, which collects Fang Fang's entries over the course of eight weeks, captures the challenges of daily life and the changing moods and emotions of being quarantined without reliable information. Um, It says here, already a bestseller in Germany, Wuhan Diary uh, is going to be translated into 18 different languages. Um, hmm. Okay, interesting. Yep, just her, her private diary on the subject. Um, capturing the challenges of daily life and the changing moods and emotions of being quarantined without reliable information. I just said that, didn't I? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Anyway. Wuhan Diary. I thought I'd check it out. Oh, and this is a gentleman. I've, re <clears throat> I've read and reviewed his most recent book, which was on the, uh, the Second Vatican Council. But this is George Weigel and the Irony of Modern Catholic History. Let's see if we can get that. There you go. Um, how the church rediscovered itself and challenged the modern world to reform. It's put out by Basic Books. Um, so this, I think, this was the the last book that came out before he wrote the the, the book on the second uh, Vatican II. Uh, throughout much of the 19th century, both secular and Catholic leaders assumed that the church and the modern world were locked in a battle to, to the death. The triumph of modernity would not only finish Catholicism as a force in world history, it would also lead to the death of religious conviction. But today the Catholic Church is far more vital than it was 200 years ago. Ironically, in its sometimes bruising encounter with modernity, Catholicism rediscovered its evangelical essence and developed intellectual tools 
capable of rescuing the imperiled modern project. Um, this book reveals how Catholicism offers 21st century free societies essential truths for our flourishing and survival. It's almost 300 pages. I enjoy his other works, uh, so I, I wanted to read his latest book. So pick that one up. Uh, on the, on the uh, <clears throat> issue of uh, uh, Christianity, I picked this book up. Intrusive God, Disruptive Gospel, Encountering the Divine in the Book of Acts by Matthew L. Skinner. This is put out by Brazos Press. It's a little paperback just hanging out there, and it sounded really good, the description. Um, and so this book illuminates passages from Acts that show the Christ Christian gospel expressing itself through the lives, speech, struggles, and adventures of Jesus' followers. Matthew Skinner shows how Acts often describes God as upsetting the status quo by changing people's lives, society's conventions, and our basic expectations of what's possible. Skinner asks serious questions and eschews pat answers, bringing Acts alive for contemporary reflection. So, I was very intrigued by that. Let me just take a water, sip, water break. Got to 89 today. How about you guys? Are you getting hot yet? Where, wherever you're at, you know, whatever your climate. <laughs> I am not the sharpest tack today. I do apologize. Um, I've been meaning to get this book for a while. I've seen it on Hamilton Book forever, and I finally pulled the trigger on it. It's Master Eichhardt. Meister I Eckhart, Philosopher of Christianity, by Kurt Flash. It's, put up. it's a Yale University Press book. Ooh. Um, this is a full-scale reappraisal of the life and legacy of Meister Eckhart, the medieval German theologian, philosopher, and alleged mystic who was active during the Avignon Papacy papacy of the 14th century and posthumously condemned as a heretic by Pope John the 22nd, disputing his subject's frequent characterization as a hero of a modern syncretic, syncretic spirituality. Flash attempts to free Eckhart from the mystical flood by inviting his readers to think along with Eckhart in a careful rereading of his Latin and German works. Um, hmm. This fascinating study makes a powerful case for Eckhart's position as an important philosopher of the time, rather than a mystic, and casts new light on an important figure of the Middle Ages, whose ideas attracted considerable attention from such diverse modern thinkers as Schopenhauer, Vivekananda, Suzuki, Fromm, and Derrida. So, uh, you know, I haven't really heard of Meister Eckhart, so I wanted to pick this up and have it accessible for when I am ready to dive in. All right. Okay, so now we're kind of moving on to current events, social, political thought, um, stuff like that. I picked this up. This is a, um, the writer here is a, um, he's the editor or editor-in-chief uh, of First Things magazine. Well, it's a journal, but I've subscribed to them for a long time. It's by This is by R.R. R. Reno, and it's called Return of the Strong Gods, Nationalism, Populism, and the Future of the West. This is put out by Regnery. R.R. R. Reno, with a new preface by the author. Oh, so the preface, this was originally published in 2019, so the preface is new to, to talk about how COVID broke out in 2020. So what is this about? After the staggering slaughter of back-to-back -back world wars, the West embraced the ideal of the open society. By liberating ourselves from the old attachments to nation, clan, and religion that have fueled centuries of violence, we hoped we could build a prosperous world without borders, free from dogmas and managed by experts. But the populism and nationalism that are upending politics in America and Europe 
are a sign that after three generations, the post-war consensus is breaking down. We are witnessing the return of the strong gods, the powerful loyalties that bind men to their homeland and to one another. The never-ending project of openness promoted by our elites is dissolving the social solidarity rooted in family, faith, and nation. <clears throat> but man will not tolerate social dissolution indefinitely. The strong gods will return, Reno warns, in, warm, in one form or another. Our task is to attend to those that, appealing to our reason as well as our hearts, inspire the best of our traditions. Otherwise, we shall invite the darker gods whose return our open society was intended to forestall. Another provocative uh, piece of writing here. So, I was intrigued. I wanted to check it out. Uh, this book is by David French. Uh, I've read some of his, uh, his, journal, his journalistic uh, ramblings and writings. Um, senior editor at the Dispatch. This is Divided We Fall, America's Secession Threat and How to Restore Our Nation. Cheery reading uh, by David French. This was put up by St. Martin's Press. This came out... When did this book come out? 2020. Um, let's see here. Two decades ago... Sorry, two decades into the first cent 21st century, the United, United States is less united as a country than at any time in our history since the Civil War. We are more diverse in our principles and societies than ever before. But red and blue states, secular and religious groups, liberal and conservative idealists, and Republican and Democratic representatives all have one thing in common. They believe that their distinct cultures and liberties are being threatened by an, in an increasingly violent opposition. This polarized tribalism, espoused by the loudest, angriest fringe extremists on both the left and the right, dismisses dialogue as appeasement. If left unchecked, it could very well lead to secession. Hmm. Hmm. So this book is an unblinking look at the true dimensions and dangers of this widening ideological gap, and what could happen if we don't take steps towards bridging it. Ooh, he depicts chilling, plausible scenarios of how the U.S. could fracture into regions Oh, I don't think I'm ready to read this. Yeah. At the time I wanted to read it, and now I'm too depressed to want to read it. <laughs> but I have it. So I'll check it out at some point. Maybe. Oh, and then this book I already have. But the, the version I have is a very... Uh, I'm looking at it right now behind this camera. Um, I have a whole shelf dedicated to the works of Thomas Sowell. Um, and this one that I had was a used copy I picked up, and it's got library markings and stickers on it. Um, and then they were offering it for, f not for free, but <laughs> um, at, a, at a really decent rate on Hamilton Books. So I picked up A Conflict of Visions, Ideological Origins of Political Struggles, and it's the revised edition, which is what I really wanted. Uh, so Thomas Sowell, um, and as you can see, it's just a brand new book. And this is what I wanted. My other one is, is really beat up. So I'll just donate that or give it to, back to the library. But this book came out in 2007. And I believe this is the book that um, Thomas Sowell uh, claims it, it is his best. Or the one he likes the most. So um, I'm really happy to have a, just a, a nicer version of, of A Conflict of Visions. And this revised edition an analyzes the centuries-long debates about the nature of reason, justice, equality, and power. It distinguishes between those with the constrained vision, which sees human nature as enduring and self-centered, and the unconstrained vision, in which human nature is malleable and perfectible. Hmm. And uh, he makes the compelling case that these opposing visions are behind the ethical and ideological disputes of yesterday and today. So it's a very important book to have. And if you're going to start reading Thomas Sowell, I really, I really suggest this one. So I picked up this book by a very, he's now a controversial author, and you know, it's been canceled everywhere, and you know, the usual mumbo jumbo. Um, as you can tell, I'm really thrilled about that. I think everyone's just getting very tired. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. <laughs> I don't know. 
Um, this is Human Diversity, uh, The Biology of Gender, Race, and Class by Charles Murray. I don't run screaming from the room, everybody. She's just, just a, an author presenting ideas that you can agree or disagree with. Charles Murray, Human Diversity. This was like 595 on Hamilton. And um, let's see here. The thesis of human diversity is that advances in genetics and neuroscience are overthrowing an intellectual orthodoxy that has ruled the social sciences for decades. The core of the orthodoxy consists of three dogmas. Gender is a social construct. Race is a social construct. Class is a function of privilege. The problem is that all three dogmas are half-truths. They have stifled progress in understanding the rich texture that biology adds to our understanding of the social, political, and economic worlds we live in. It is not a story to be feared. There are no monsters in the closet, Murray writes, no dread doors we must fear opening. But it is a story that needs telling. Human diversity does so, does so without sensationalism, drawing on the most authoritative scientific findings celebrating both our many differences and our common humanity. So, I mean, what's so wrong with that, right? Um, I've got a couple of other books by Charles Murray. Um, but, yeah, I, I like reading these books that kind of challenge. And that I want to read more about, like, science and stuff as well. <laughs> science and stuff. Yeah, Peg. Um, I'm just trying to read a little bit more outside of my comfort zone. Out of you know, um, I, I'll always history will always be in my number one. But um, yeah, I'm 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 kind of trying lately with things I've been ordering and buying um, to 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 read more outside of my categories. So I thought this one might be challenging. So I wanted to check it out, and it was super cheap. Okay, so I also picked up this book, and um, I'm not going to make a lot of comments about it because, well, well, I will. Oh, it doesn't matter, does it? <laughs> Sorry. I'm a little down today, guys, can you tell? Um, it's just the state of the world, and... Um, uh, you know, up is down. Good is evil, right is wrong, wrong is right. I don't know what the hell's going on. <laughs> I don't know. I just trust in Jesus. That's all I can do. So, all right. But I think I, I heard this author on a podcast, and she's she, this is an important work, and I think people it would behoove people to read this book um, with an open mind and not be reactionary immediately when you see the title. Okay, so this is Irreversible Damage. The Transgender Craze Seducing Our Daughters by Abigail Schreier. I've watched her on interviews. Um, she, her erudition has just blown me away. Her, her research, the level of research that she's done is, is just breathtaking. So um, I wanted to read this. We're at 28 minutes. Got a couple more. Let me just read... And this is particularly talking about, just is talking about girls on um, this one. So today, whole groups of female friends in colleges, high schools, and even middle schools across the country are coming out as transgender. These are girls who had never experienced any discomfort in their biological sex until they heard a coming out story from a speaker at a school assembly or discovered the internet community of trans influencers. Unsuspecting parents are awakening to find their daughters in thrall to hip trans YouTube stars and gender-affirming educators and therapists who push life-changing interventions on young girls, including medically unnecessary double mastectomies and puberty blockers that can cause permanent infertility. A generation of girls is at risk. Abigail Schreier's essential book, um, it will help you understand what the trans craze is and how you can inoculate your child against it or how to retrieve her, her, from this dangerous path. So, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be canceled. I'm gonna be canceled. Just cause I showed the book, right? 
So um, I'm excited to show these two books because, um, well, these are the fiction. We're going to end with fiction. And this is only part one of my Hamilton book haul. Um, uh, I'll make the second one here shortly. Um, but I want to make sure I can upload this and that it doesn't take five hours. Okay, so shout out to Johnny Keen. Um, after he showed this book on his channel, and I already had several of these books in the NYRB Classics line of his works, um, but I really wanted to pick up Victor Serge's Men in Prison. It's this fictionalized account of when he was um, in a French penitentiary. So I was really happy to find this, and thank you to Johnny Keene. It still wasn't super cheap. It was like $9.95, but I wanted to pay extra just to get this. Um, well, not extra. I think it was even more on Amazon, so this was actually the cheapest volume I could find. So, it's his, it's, um, his time spent in there, and uh, let's see. Yeah. He served five years, from 1912 to 1917, for the crime of criminal association. Um, in fact, for his courageous refusal to testify against his old comrades, the infamous tragic bandits of French anarchism. Ah, okay. So, uh, really happy to find this. Thank you, Johnny, for recommending to all of us out here. Appreciate it. And then I've been meaning to get this... Um, Boy, we've had a lot of writers just uh, die recently, haven't we? Um, and this is one of them. Let's see, Martin Amos, Inside Story and Novel. I want to read more of his work. I know this is the last one, but uh, I've heard pretty good reviews from everybody who's read it. And it's kind of almost like, you know, well, it is like autobiographical. Um, so... And it's, yeah, I just wanted to pick up this, this book. And I've got more books coming that I ordered. I think Cormac McCarthy died, and I, I had previously ordered a few months ago, which I, and I haven't read them yet, but his, two, his last two works, was it Stella Mars and, or Maris? Stella Mars and um, The Passenger. But what I really want to read first is I've been dying to read both Blood Meridian and No Country for Old Men. So I ordered those two books from Amazon. They were having a buy three for two sale, and so I was able to get those. Those are on the way. But anyway, so I, I picked this up. Martin, Novice's, Martin Amos's Inside Story, a novel. I don't know why I can't speak. Okay, guys, so I have a whole other stack I'm looking at. I will wrap this one up. Come back and join me for round two of just... History, nonfiction, bargain books galore from HamiltonBook.com. All right. Thanks for joining me, BookTube. We'll talk soon. Bye.